Previously on Legends and Lies. Virginia has seceded. There's but a river between us and the rebels. Where the devil is McClellan? He's as late to a meeting as he is to a battle. It has been nearly a year with no battle undertaken at your command. Look at Jackson standing there like a stone wall when you charge. believe slavery to be right. That's where the fight is here. I remember Turner's rebellion. Virginia cannot stand such horrors again. Forces are too great. We need to retreat and we need to protect the capital. We have paid a heavy price today. The failure is mine. Sir, but Jackson! The failure is mine. And mine alone. We do no honor to those brave men who fell here today if we retreat. Ways forward, not back. the foundation of the fragile union. Dividing a young nation over the issues of freedom, slavery, and equality. In a brutal battle of attrition, heroes will rise, cities will fall, and the blood of thousands will stain the land. America's struggle for life, liberty, and justice for all becomes the Civil War. between loyalty to his state and duty to his country. The defining symbol of Southern gentility. But behind every symbol stands a man. And behind every legend lies the truth. What's the state of the battle, soldier? Where's General Johnston? Where is General Johnston? In his first year of war, Robert E. Lee, much like George Washington, is an unproven general leading an ill-equipped army in defense of his homeland. Lee is a true Virginian, born in the shadow of Mount Vernon, and through marriage becomes a part of the Washington family. He inherits all that comes with such a distinction, from the prestige and legacy down to property, including slaves once owned by the president himself. While Lee has an opportunity to follow Washington's footsteps and declare loyalty to Virginia over the Union, 
He turns his back on his founding father's vision of the United States, changing the course of American history forever. It's chaos out there, Mr. President. It's chaos. Looks like General Johnston won't be commanding this army much longer. Even if he survives, he's in no shape to continue. In the year since their victory at the Battle of Bull Run, the poorly supplied Confederate Army has lost its momentum. Union General George McClellan, who leads 115,000 well-equipped, well-trained troops to the gates of the rebel capital, has pushed them back to Richmond. Now with his commander injured, Confederate President Jefferson Davis must decide who will lead his army. You must assume command. You must assume. I wish there was someone more capable, sir. Do you think Lincoln and that old bird Scott would have offered you command of the federal forces if you weren't capable? Brother G. Lee! General Scott. You know what's at stake. This nation truly is at war with itself. And we are fighting to honor the ideals of our forefathers, which is why you must lead this army. Robert E. Lee married into a line of succession that goes directly back to George Washington. And with the renown and respect that he commanded, there were some that thought of him as the second coming of George Washington. Unionists, well, say, look at George Washington. He said, prize the Union above any local allegiance. There's no Massachusetts or Virginia in this army. This, this is an American army. Secessionists will say, no, no, George Washington fought against a union with the British. If we are to die, let us die. As a free people, not as slaves to tyranny. I, too, wish to honor our fathers, to fight for freedom, as General Washington did, in the service of my home country. So you will do it. No, General. I am a Virginian. I hope never to draw my sword again except in defense of my native state. I hereby resign from the United States Army. Before the Civil War, many Americans, particularly Southerners, believe their citizenship and loyalty is with their home state, not their country. However, there are some Virginians, like General Scott, who fight for the federal government, but not Robert E. Lee. He puts the defense of his beloved Virginia over preserving the Union, choosing to become a rebel officer. And while history is conflicted over Lee's private stance of slavery in fighting for states' rights to secede, he is publicly and violently defending the institution of slavery. You are making the biggest mistake of your life. You will command this army. And you will save our capital. Lee takes over a demoralized Confederate army, low on munitions and manpower, devoid of manufacturing, squeezed by the Union's coastal blockade. The South appears to be one battle away from losing the war. This is a desperate time for the Confederacy. The army that Lee inherits is not in good condition. Clearly, they need not only someone to bring a kind of order and discipline, but also to inspire them. With the Confederate armies back against the wall, Lee summons Generals Stonewall Jackson, James Longstreet, and A.P. Hill to lay out his strategy. We cannot permit McClellan to attack Richmond. We must draw him away from the capital. I propose that we divide our forces. But that would leave Richmond exposed, hoping to attack. 
Robert E. Lee has a brilliant battle plan for what becomes known as the Battles of the Seven Days. He wants to force General McClellan into a fight. He will take the majority of his army and go on the offensive against General McClellan. There is some danger that the enemy will just rush into Richmond because you will have left Richmond vulnerable. We have no other choice. Even with our full force, we could not survive a frontal attack from McClellan. McClellan has no nerve. God wills us to victory. As long as we are bold, we shall prevail. General Jackson, everything hinges on your core being in position in 48 hours. Can you make that march? We have never failed to make a march yet. Jackson was not only just brilliant in terms of leading men in the thick of battle, but also getting them to march very, very quickly. His troops were so quick that they were known as the foot cavalry. Though Lee's generals are behind him, most rebel soldiers aren't convinced that Lee is the man to lead the South to victory. The previous year, he suffers humiliating defeat in Western Virginia at the Battle of Cheat Mountain and loses Fort Pulaski in Georgia. Prepare for the enemy advance. The Southern troops aren't prepared for the all-out fight Lee has in store for both them and the unsuspecting Union Army. It's alive! Lee will unleash the true horrors of war. Forming him in the eyes of his men and the world. In the march, your friends and Robert E. Lee, handpicked to lead the Union Army, now commands Confederate forces in a desperate fight to drive the Yankees away from Richmond. Prepare for the enemy advance. Lee devises a complex plan to overwhelm the Federals, but the strategy proves too ambitious for his commanders. There's General Jackson and his men are slaughtered. Robert E. Lee wants Stonewall Jackson to turn the right flank of the U.S. positions, but this Confederate attack is not perfectly coordinated. Casualties are immense, and McClellan moves close to capturing the Confederate capital at Richmond. We didn't stand a chance. Despite a long military career, General Lee has little experience leading men in battle. And like George Washington, who failed early and often in the Revolutionary War, Lee is shaped by a devastating loss and the amount of southern blood on his hands. After being humiliated at Mechanicsville, Lee's response will not only determine the immediate fate of the Confederate Army, but it will also determine if he can live up to the potential that has, for so long, overshadowed the proud soldier from Virginia. forces are too great. We need to retreat, and we need to protect the capital immediately. A.P. Hill's force suffers high casualties in this attack, only because they're not being supported by Jackson as initially planned, and Longstreet opposed attacking Union positions because McClellan moves to within striking distance of Richmond. We have paid a heavy price today. The failure is mine. Sir, but Jackson! The failure is mine. And mine alone. We do no honor to those brave men who fell here today. 
If we retreat, the way is forward, not back. Up to this point, Lee's not experienced a lot of military success during the American Civil War. One observer said that Lee defined audacity, that Lee was the kind of person who would take the chances that needed to be taken to drive the Yankees back from Richmond. To save the Confederacy and his reputation, Lee has only one choice, continue the offensive and hope that McClellan is too apprehensive to advance on Richmond. Lieutenant McClellan. Lee and McClellan served together in the Mexican-American War, where Lee's aptitude for battle reveals a striking difference between the young officer and himself. Imagine if you could outflank the enemy and take their position without any casualties. That would be something. You will always have casualties in war, Lieutenant. There will always be death. Lee understood that it wasn't just about hardware, that it wasn't just about numbers. It was about knowing who was up against him. And if he knew who was up against him, he could beat him. McClellan won't attack without an overwhelming advantage. So the wily rebel general launches a deception campaign, spreading out artillery and marching his soldiers in loops to make his army appear larger, completely fooling McClellan's spies. Well, how many are there? At least 180,000 rebels, General. That is a low estimate. George McClellan is getting a lot of his intelligence from Alan Pinkerton. He starts coming back with these inflated numbers. How are we to defeat nearly 200,000 rebels with our meager army? Can the Secretary of War explain that? Can the President? The only thing McClellan didn't really want to do was fight a battle. He had this paralysis that overcame him based on a love for his troops and unwillingness to sacrifice them into slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Pinkerton. That'll be all. Lee's deception and Pinkerton's exaggerations spook McClellan. He fails to recognize his opportunity to take Richmond and forfeits the advantage to Lee. <laughs> against the army of George McClellan with a savagery that scares the daylights out of McClellan. General, assemble your division in the rear of this hill. Yes, General. of huge deficits in manpower and supplies. Lee relentlessly sends rebel after rebel into the mouth of the Union war machine. Though Confederate losses are staggering, McClellan falls back. Over a series of blood-soaked battles, Lee pushes McClellan all the way to the James River. The Union commander wants to order a full retreat. He can only have but a few troops guarding Richmond. Sir, we must attack. Lee knows the importance of Richmond. To have it on good authority, he has at least 100,000 men circling the city. We must preserve our artillery and change base. Say what you mean. You want to retreat. I will not tolerate. You, sir, are not fit to lead. I may be a one-armed New Jersey son of a bitch, but at least I am not a coward. Turn it! Come out of here! After one week of hard-hitting attacks, Robert E. Lee is transformed from a has-been to a Confederate hero. 
But his success comes at the cost of over 20,000 dead and wounded rebel soldiers. Sir, I do believe you hurt them as much as they hurt you. We punish them well at any rate. Yes, sir. Our success has not been so great or complete as we could have desired. God knows what is best for us. Robert Lee is angry. He's angry because he thought that the Northern Army should have been destroyed. There was a great opportunity. In truth, Lee's plans were a little too complicated for that to happen. Stand the Blue Belly! Stage! Stage! Stand the Blue Belly! Robert Lee starts to develop a relationship with the soldiers. The soldiers begin to think that Robert E. Lee is the right general. He can lead them. There's a trust that will begin to develop throughout the war. On June 26th, the powerful army of the enemy was entrenched within view of our capital. Today, he lies on the banks of the James River, 30 miles from Richmond. You, the Army of Northern Virginia, have saved our state and our confederacy from destruction. Soon, we will achieve our independence. The South has every reason to imagine a future where Southern forces halt U.S. Army forces. The Confederates can once again taste victory, but Lee knows that he is still outnumbered and outgunned by the Union Army and he can't truly really achieve victory until he destroys them completely. Dear Four Mothers, your society was led by a woman. Lee, once one of the U.S. Army's most promising officers, now fights against the United States, carrying the hopes of the Confederacy. As long as Lee's armies exist, this rebellion is going to continue. It's sort of like the way George Washington was in the American Revolution. As long as Lee's army stays in the field, the North are losing. I need to send a telegram. To the Secretary of War, Washington. I lost this battle because my forces were too small. If I save this army now, I tell you plainly that I owe no thanks to you or any of persons in Washington. After a humiliating defeat at Lee's hands, Union General George McClellan has lost the confidence of the North and President Lincoln. McClellan, having built up this magnificent fighting force, doesn't want to see it wantonly or quickly destroyed on the field of battle. And that also then means that he's not being aggressive enough, which is why he clashes with the president and which is why he is ultimately sacked from his position. With the Union Army really, the South has convinced the world that they can win the war. And European countries like Great Britain may soon recognize the Confederacy as an independent nation. Great Britain understood that Confederate victory was of critical importance to its textile industry. Dividing the United States would allow Great Britain to dominate the Western Hemisphere. So the British really wanted to hold back until they believed that they could guarantee a Confederate victory. Men of the Army of Virginia, gather around! With Britain on the rebels' side, the Union would be lost. Desperate for a win, Lincoln calls on the aggressive General John Pope to take on Lee. I have come to you from the West, where we have always seen the backs of our enemies. And I will pursue the enemy until he is defeated. <laughs> Problem is, when Pope comes in, right, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm genius who's been winning battles in the West while all you Easterners have been blowing it. That doesn't go over well with the troops. Pope takes a hardline stance against the rebels, ordering Confederate property seized, crops destroyed, and guerrillas executed, enraging Lee and the South. Oh, man. Thank you for coming, General Jackson. This miscreant Pope may be a different sort of beast from McClellan, but his army is just as large. If we permit him to strike Richmond, we die. Then we don't permit him. Precisely. Strike 
his supply lines. Here. I'll have my men there in two days. With Pope in his sights, Lee changes tactics and lets Stonewall Jackson loose on the Yankees. Lee sends Jackson to raid the federal storehouses at Manassas Junction, hoping to deplete the enemy's resources and lay a trap for Pope's Union Army. Press that on! Jackson marches his troops 50 miles through a maze of Union forces. Under the cover of night, they pillage Union supplies and burn everything they can take with them. Lee didn't believe in a chivalrous exchange of fire with the enemy. He believed in the absolute annihilation of the opposing force. Savoring the destruction of Union property, Lee's army grows more aggressive and confident, just like their leader. Gentlemen, a moment, please. The General Pope and Uncle Abe. <laughs> I didn't think you drank the bark juice, sir. I love liquor as much as any man in this army. <laughs> but liquors are not good for me. I question whether they are much good to anyone. Colonel, round up all the liquor. See it discarded. Jackson's men disappear into the woods, setting a trap for John Pope. Union troops, including the Iron Brigade, march toward Manassas, hunting for the legendary Stonewall. The Iron Brigade takes its name from the fact that General George McClellan said, those men are fighting like iron. And so the name stuck. And they were absurdly proud of that fact. Don't waste the bullet. It's Stonewall Jackson we're looking for. Not your average Johnny Reb. Robert E. Lee's tenacity has paid off. He's finally in control of the war, and with his newfound confidence, he plans to demoralize the enemy and force a truce. Gentlemen, bring up your mare! Stonewall Jackson becomes Lee's most reliable weapon, and the two of them take to viciously assaulting the Union troops. Together, they are relentless in their pursuit, pushing the enemy farther north and closer to a breaking point. Stonewall Jackson aces down the Iron Brigade on the same battlefield where he earned his nickname. The second battle of Bull Run begins in bloody chaos. Robert E. Lee's rebel army is up for its biggest fight yet. And if they win, it could be the end of the Union Army and the United States. Why are we taking him? I have no clue. We're just TV doctors. If this was a real emergency, I'd be freaking out. But thanks to Cigna, we can do more than just look heroic. We can help save lives by getting you to a real doctor for a checkup. Nurse, this thing's defective. Please don't touch that. We are the TV Doctors of America. Together with Cigna reminding you... To go, know, and take control of your health. Doctor poses! Cigna. Together. All the way. Before discovering Nexium 24-hour to treat her frequent heartburn, Lucy can only imagine enjoying a slice of pizza. Now, it's as easy as pie. Nexium 24-hour stops acid before it starts for all-day, all-night protection. Can you imagine 24 hours without heartburn? Maria's always on the go, taking over 7,000 steps each day, and she does it in any shoe she wants, with lasting comfort. Stonewall Jackson has this decisiveness that few of Lee's generals have. Charge! Lee knows that if he tells Jackson to do something, Jackson will find a way to make it happen. Since 
suffering his first loss, General Lee no longer gives the commanders detailed tactical plans. Instead, they receive broad orders that are sometimes vague and obscure. But the main objective remains clear. Drive the Union Army out of Virginia and crush them. Stonewall Jackson, who shares Lee's aggressive instinct to attack, thrives under the general's method. But some Confederate officers find his hands-off style of leadership confusing and are slow to take action. So Lee and the Confederate Army depend on how well his commanders can interpret his strategy. Robert E. Lee rides to Manassas with General Longstreet's corps to join Jackson, ready to bring the full Army of Northern Virginia against John Pope's Union forces. But both sides have snipers scattered behind enemy lines, looking to pick off unsuspecting officers. Well, the bullets were flying. It was kosher to take down the commander in a battle. Generals were shot out from their horses all the time. Find out if there's a report from Jackson. Yes, General. We must get out of range. I don't think that card can come this close twice, do you? Lee's courage inspires his generals to form a united front and stay on the offensive. While the Union command is crumbling, General McClellan refuses to come to Jim Pope's aid. But the Yankees have more men and supplies than the Rebels. Fall back! Retreat! 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 And as the Union makes a determined charge to break the Confederate lines at an unfinished railroad cut, the Rebels run low on ammunition. this fighting spirit of Robert E. Lee. Confederate soldiers believe that one Confederate soldier can whip ten Yankees. Even without bullets, Lee's men fight on for their general and the Confederacy he symbolizes using any weapon they can find. We're waking up America and we're telling them what's going on in the world. That is such an awesome responsibility, but it's fun. What we're trying to do is not only tell you what's going on, but the backstory. We're able to tell the folks at home, hey, this is important to you. This is why you need to listen. We have a great, honest conversation about what's happening in the news. When people meet us, when they see us, they feel like they know us because guess what? They do. The only way to be successful on Fox is to be yourself. And you know what? We do that every day. We're finally back out in our yard. But so are they. Introducing Scott's Turf Builder Triple Action. It kills weeds, prevents crabgrass, and feeds so grass can thrive. Guaranteed. Our backyard is back. This is a Scott's Yard. Online dating? I know people meet that way, but where would I even begin? Open laptop? Go to OurTime.com? Look for free. It's easy to take a look on OurTime, the fastest growing...